Welcome, everyone, to another Voices with Raveki. I am here with Kazra Mirzai. Um, Kazra is going to be part of this ongoing discussion we're having on this channel with people who are practitioners and also researchers about IFS, uh, Internal Family Systems Theory. And I'm very excited about this. I've met Kazra offline, and uh, we've had a really interesting conversation. I'm really looking forward to this one. But Kazra, why don't you introduce yourself, tell us a little bit more about your background, and then maybe we can talk about some of uh, your work and how it weaves into uh, what we're doing here at the Verveki Foundation, and then we'll just take it from there. Yes, thank you very much, John. Thanks for having me. Oh, great pleasure. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I'm a I'm a psychotherapist by training. I'm a I'm a practitioner. I'm a clinician, and I'm a researcher and teacher at a university in Hildesheim in Germany. And um, what I focus on is like there are a couple of things I focus on. So my research is on emotion regulation and developmental psychopathology. So I'm looking mostly on adolescent on the adolescent age and the age group um, and what I'm doing there is I look at how psychotherapy has an impact on it. So we know that psychotherapy works, but we don't know why to a lot of degrees. And, um, and I have a more of a dynamical systems theoretical view on it. And I look at affect dynamics and see how affect and emotion fluctuate and, um, yeah, have their ups and downs and look at those in, in especially in teenagers. But at the same time, I'm also more oriented to a more global view, more theoretical view. And um, I'm also deeply influenced by um, one of my uh, doctoral supervisors, Werner Greve. He's a um, professor for developmental psychology. And he's actually, um, I'm in this academic ancestral line of Baltus and Staudinger. Uh, you mm, mentioned them wow. in the Munich yeah, crisis. Yeah. So Werner yeah, Greve, yeah. he actually, he did his PhD on the, Paul Baltus, so he has this lifespan, uh, lifespan perspective on, on development. And yeah, I try to bring in those aspects, but also the theoretical aspects. And he's also deeply into action theory and philosophical psychology. So I also follow this, this trend to look more broadly onto meaning making, I would say. And this is where IFS comes in. And as a practitioner of IFS um, and a research, I, I also do research on it. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm deeply interested in, in the, also in the cock side of it and the, in the cognitive science of it. And, um, yeah, and then this whole machinery of meaning making. So, yeah, that's where I come from. <laughs> so what, what would you like to start, talk about first? I mean, we could pick up on a particular thread, uh, and uh, give people, um, you know, a, a more specific example of what your work looks like and, how it's related to meaning and uh, the meaning crisis, perhaps that would be great. Yeah, I think, oh, that's a good question. Where to start? I think there are several path, paths that could, with, that we could take and um, maybe start. I, I know that your audience knows uh, IFS by now, but maybe just to sum up for them. Oh, I think we could, we can always talk more about it. I mean, I, I yeah, the work with, uh, with Seth, Seth Dillon, uh, Seth Ellison, Allison. Seth Allison, yeah, exactly. Seth, Seth Allison has been uh, really, really uh, profound. Um, and um, but I think having many voices articulate what it is could be very helpful to uh, our, our our listeners. Yes, and I really enjoyed those videos. Um, I also wanted to extend that and, and and tell you that I think you both have done a very wonderful job. It was it was actually really different to experience both of you i mean um seth does uh, you know did an excellent job he has this wonderful personality and you also show different sides and aspects of yourself john so i really like that too um, yeah well vulnerable. Seth, uh, thank you for saying that and i apologize to seth i think when i first mentioned him i confused him with seth dillinger i apologize about that but seth allison yes um yeah, he, uh, we spoke before time and he proposed doing this and, um, yeah, I knew it would be challenging, uh, but I thought it, people needed a concrete example uh, yes. in order to get a, a deeper sense of what was going on. I agree. I agree. I, I think sometimes we tend to be way too abstract and theoretical. So 
yeah. it needs something to ground ourselves again. So, yeah, maybe to connect to that, um, yeah, just really, really briefly and shortly, what I what I think or my take on IFS is that it's actually a model of a living and self-organizing psyche um, that is composed of, I would say, living things. And um, Dick Schwartz would say subpersonalities, or we could call them parts. And um, yeah, those interact with, with each other in a, in a certain, and again, this is my language, in a certain qualitative space and relationship that we would call the self. And um, so you see, again, this is my notion of it. It's actually tainted there. I, I don't assume a monadic self. I rather right, assume right, a yeah. relational, yeah. flexible, and um, the self is more as a process than a product. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, so in that sense, IFAS assumes the multiplicity of, of the psyche or a multiplicity of the psyche. And um, yeah, I would, I, would, I would want to start maybe to, um, by linking it to the meaning crisis because I think this is so deeply important. And then we can come to my work and how my perspectives from, I also forgot to mention that I uh, worked um, many years in psycho-oncology, in pediatric psycho-oncology. And, um, and I currently work at a residential um, adolescent residential crisis center where I work like with borderline personality disorders and very, very traumatized young people. And I'm so confronted with this whole absurdity and the and meaning crisis that you automatically, you try to find ways and you try to make sense out of it. So, and I see deep, deep connections there. And um, so I would say the short answer is that IFS helps both the cognitive as well as the existential and spiritual machinery of meaning making. So it's, well, that's, yeah, that's very powerful. Yeah. And I think via uh, a dialectic, it's a dialectical approach. Um, and, and I think we can add in more mythos and I mean, not only the logos, but also the mythos and fundamentally IFS again, is a dialogical practice and a form, I would say a form of serious play to, use one yes. of your yeah. terms or you to use your language yes. and an, and the serious play it helps to systematically modify salience in a sense and 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 obviously to switch and and change perspectives so this perspective taking is very very important and i think ifs is powerful in doing so and um it helps you forward and come into contact with your yeah with different aspects of your of your being in your identity and, 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 and in doing so get a grasp on your inner conflict in a platonic sense and to wow. resolve, hopefully resolve those inner conflicts. <laughs> that, that was just, wow. That was just <laughs> wonderful. Uh, and so I heard, uh, let me see. I want to, I want to make sure I get all these threads. You mentioned salience and perspective taking you you mentioned people get uh, a, a sort of an enrichment of their self awareness. They they discover, uncover, uh, realize different aspects of themselves. Uh, and then uh, there, there's also you you were talking a little bit. Well, let, let's start with those three first of all. Uh, <laughs> sure. Uh, uh, and then you, we can pick up on any threads that are, are remaining. Um. So I get. I uh, I get that it alters salience uh, uh, because um, it gets people to pay attention to things they weren't previously paying attention to within their psyche. Is that the main that that's the salience? I I, I know I might be oversimplifying. I'm just trying to get the initial idea. No, here. I think I think that's that's totally fair, and um and I think there is there is again a machinery behind that, um and I think this has deeply to do with. Uh, um, I think um, dynamical system theory can here can help us understand what we mean also by this idea of salience. So what I understand or what I mean when I talk about salience is that, and again, I would say this is deeply um, psychodynamic or depth psychological. That's a, um, IFS is really related to that. Of that, course. That you're not the master in your own house. Something is driving you. Right. Yeah, and that's the platonic theme you were bringing exactly. up earlier about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yes. Something is driving you. So those different forces, and um, they have their own framing. They have their own sets of glasses that they put on. 
right? They yeah. see the world from their perspectives because they have their own agent arena relationship. Yeah, so, yeah, that's so really, this is what I would bring in. And and what I mean when I talk about dynamical systems theory is that I think those forces that drive us, they they are a system in a sense that they are a complex system, a biological system. That's why I'm think, talking about living things. Which means, and, and living things are memory systems. And I think this is, this is an aspect of dynamical systems theory that is um, often overlooked. But we're, it's, they are deeply, so biological systems are memory systems. And this has to do with this technical notion of non-ergodicity. And um, yes, yes. Um, I don't know if we should expand on this or not, but... Um, well, we could. I mean, it, it it overlaps with some of the significant work Michael Levin's doing, and some of the conversations I've had with him. Can I can I can I, can I ask you please. a question at this point? Yes. So, um, I get that this is wonderful. So let, let's at least say there are sort of autopoietic systems, right? There, they uh, they're they're seeing the world in a certain way, and they have a certain function, and they're trying to maintain themselves and and satisfy that function or functions. I, I don't want to be too simplistic. Is that okay so far? Um, Absolutely. And then, and I like this idea of they, they each have a different framing and agent arena relationship. And that means, of course, they can come into conflict in some uh, significant way. And this is the platonic model you were alluding to earlier from the Republic, right? Yes. You've got this inner conflict. <clears throat> and then I, 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 I've been wondering about this. So I, I have a question to ask. Um, so Plato posits the idea that we have meta drives we have two fundamental meta drives uh one is um a kind of inner justice inner peace we we whatever it however we try to satisfy our goals and um our desire sorry satisfy our desires and reach our goals we don't want that to cause more internal conflict we want it to bring resolution uh to that conflict and an inner binding and an inner religio and then we have another uh, important uh drive which is we want to be most in contact uh, with what is most real. We don't want whatever is satisfying our goals or satisfying our desires to be illusory, fraudulent, anything. And so the question is this, I, I, I'm not very happy with you know, thinking about the self as some sort of um, thing. Um, and you seem to be also like that. You described it as a space. And I, I'm thinking, I'm wondering if it's a functional space. What I mean by that is maybe perhaps the self is understood as that which is um, these two meta drives. The self is that which is driving for the resolution of inner conflict and bringing us into conflict, sorry, bringing us into contact with reality. What do you think about that as a proposal? That that is maybe how we could understand the fundamental functionality of the self. Given that you raised the platonic model, it seems like there's a way of understanding the self in terms of that platonic model. That's wonderful. Can you repeat that again? I, that, that's, so, that's so rich. I have to uh, think about you, this again. You. Yeah. So Plato has this proposal, right? Um, he doesn't state it like it explicitly as a, as a, a, sing, as a standalone proposition, but it, it very clearly comes out in many places, in many dialogues, most prominently in the Republic, which is the one you were alluding to, um, that we we have a desire for inner peace but this is not just that's why he also uses the word justice it's that yes a it's the optimal gripping it's the yeah, optimal yeah. gripping it's this har harmonic interplay right yes yes and so we want we have this there's a, there's a meta drive to bring about that harmonic interplay so you can call it sort of this vertical optimal gripping if i can allow, allow that and then but we also have this meta drive of hor horizontal optimal gripping with the world <laughs> and other people. And the self is those two functions. And what Plato talks about is it's possible to actually coordinate the satisfaction of those two functions. And I would put it to you that it sounds to me like IFS is exactly a practice for coordinating them because you're trying to get the parts in this harmonious sense so that you can get a better grip on reality thereby. Wonderful. That's exactly what I'm what I'm thinking. There's so many things there um, that I can I can follow up on maybe. So um, I absolutely think it's about meta desires because and I and I would bring also in the good, the true, and the beautiful. 
especially well, I think the that's, good. Yeah, I, that's implicit I think that's in it. The, yeah, it's these two axes, right? The yes. true, the good, and the beautiful are going both ways. Yes. Because yeah. when you actually do parts work and, and they, they get into this harmonic self-organization and self-realization is that now, it, at least it feels like they're committed to something that they share what parts share and it this transcends their individual desires and needs so exactly. there are meta desires and meta needs and yeah, i think it yeah. is to be deeply in contact with reality that's one aspect and and for for this harmonic interplay to go on because it's an iterative game right so i so so the 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 efficient the resiliency is, is in is long term efficiency so not only for the sake of self maintenance and in an autopoetic sense and and i think this makes it deeply human and we should definitely talk about anthropology as well and this connects to my work in in oncology and um also as in in psychiatry because i think it's missing we have a deeply dehumanized anthropology going on but um what i mean by by make us human is to not only to care for ourselves but also to care for others i think that's i think that's wonderful so this this so Plato has a term, and you might have heard me talk about it, the anagoge, uh, anagoge for right? And, and, and so I, I, I think you're in agreement, the self is kind of the anagogic function. It's these two meta desires, right, coordinated together to bring about the reciprocal opening of the human being, the flourishing with the world. And, and I think this connection is, I, I think, really, really powerful, because I think if we, if we agree that what Plato is proposing is something that increases our inner peace, our connectedness to reality, affords our capacity for self-transcendence, cultivation of wisdom. We're now talking about something that can properly be called spiritual um, without having to invoke any supernaturalism. And, th and this, I think, and as I've had discussions with people doing IFS, many of them want to sort of bring out the fact that IFS has this sort of spiritual dimension to it. Uh, and I think that lines up with your wanting to bring in the mythos and the imaginal. Yes, um, exactly. And, and yes, yes, yeah. yes. Wow. Thank you, John. That's, um, <laughs> yeah, you're exactly saying what I'm, what I was thinking. Thank you for watching. This YouTube and podcast series is by the Verveke Foundation, which in addition to supporting my work, also offers courses, practices, workshops, and other projects dedicated to responding to the meaning crisis. If you would like to support this work, please consider joining our Patreon. You can find the link in the show notes. I want to I, I want to propose something to you, and this please. has really something to do with your work. and And I hope I get your work right, and you can now see if I get your work right. And if not, please correct me or add or compliment to it. Um, yeah, we'll work. We'll work through. We'll work through anything that comes up together as friends. <laughs> um, I want to compare you to Kant. Okay, to okay. Kant. So I want to see where both overlap. So the way I understand your work is, and where I see you both in agreement, so Kant and Verveke, is that you both understand that reality ultimately cannot be framed, right? So where I see you both differ is that what reality ultimately is. Now, whereas Kant sees reality as this thing outside of our cognitive and rational faculties that uses frames and filters to make sense out of experiences, which leads Kant to the conclusion, right, that we cannot have this access to the thing in itself, this thing on sich, the noumena, and that we are ultimately trapped within our mind. I would propose John Viveki <laughs> would yeah. say that although our frames prevent us of grasping whole, the whole reality, we can still participate in it, right? We nonetheless participate in reality via these things like myth-making, mythos, mythopoesis, music, symbols, art, rituals, poetry, and all of that. So um, I want to go on, if you, if you just allow me, and this dance and this serious play between uh, so basically the, the imaginal, what I wanted to say. Yes, yes. So yes. basically the, the, the dance and serious play between the ultimate and the finite or, um, is a constant process of opening and closing. I would also say of homing and adventuring, right? So getting back to your home, to your basis, but also, you know, leaving 
the this, this safe haven and also going to exploration, this meta assimilation accommodation that you talk about. And, and this leads me to following conclusion. And now let's see if you agree. And because this brings again back in the idea of self and where I see IFS overlap, but at the same time also differ and where I also have problems with it, obviously. So I, I would say there is no soul beyond the body. That, that's my first proposition. I said there is no soul beyond the body. So the self-organizing process of me being in the world, being in space and time, infuses in nature, physical, right, is the soul. So the, whole, the soul is that emergent thing out of the body, the interaction of the body, but at the same time, that that emanates back, right? So the idea of emanation is important. So um, and this animating principle, the anima, the, the suke that we talk about. And um, the second proposal is there is no self beyond otherness. That's what I would propose. So meaning the self is this emergent thing out of the interactions of those parts. And again, this is why I think dynamical systems theory is so important also from a scientific perspective, because it brings in this whole idea of myriology, this parts whole relationship. Yes. Right? Yes. And, and one of the many. Yeah, exactly. One of many. Exactly. So the self that is that which homes otherness as spectuality at the same time, it's, it, it's the, the, you know, it's, it's the parts and the otherness that gives home to the self. So, I mean, Kierkegaard has this, has this, uh, what's the quote? The self is a relation that relates itself to itself. Yeah, so, yeah, yes, so yes. What I mean by relationship and process, and that's why I, I would agree it's not a monadic thing, is that the self is, is, is a constant process. And I love the idea that it's, that it's this two axis kind of thing that you mentioned, those, those two dynam dimensions, the inner conflict, the resolution of inner conflict, as well as getting into contact with reality. Now, the third one, when I, what I want to propose is that there was no, no thing, not a thing, no thing beyond the spirit of intelligibility. So beyond, in other words, beyond this organizing principle, the God beyond, beyond gods that you're talking about. And, um, so, and I think this is what, what Jung would call the anima mundi or the unus mundus. And I think this is similar to the idea of self. So I think it's, Jung is not talking about this. I mean, there are parts where talking about this monadic self, but um, I assume he, I think he assumes something different when he talks about the self. And you, it, it becomes clear when he talks about the mandala, like these four dimensions. To me, they are similar to those four dimensions of meaning making, the nomological, the normative, and the narrative order, as well as the connectedness. So, um, yeah, not to intellectualize too, too much now, but, um, what I was trying to refer to is that in IFS, you often talk about the self as the part that is not a part. And to me, this alludes a lot, or this sounds very similar to the God that is not, not a God or the God yeah, beyond yeah. God, oh, okay. yeah, the religion yeah, yeah, yeah. that is not a religion. So there, that it doesn't have this thingness to it. Yeah. So what do you think? Well, let, that was incredibly rich. Yeah. Okay. So I'll try and trace through some of this. Um, I think, yeah, um, what you said about my relationship to Kant is um, amazing. I take, of course, from Kant the idea of framing, um, and, 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 uh, and then I, that's what the relevance realization. But unlike Kant, I don't think the mind is the author of framing. I think the mind yeah, oh, participates yeah. with the world in, in framing. So I would add that E, right? There's in framing going on. And relevance is a, something co-created by the world and the mind. And that's what makes me fundamentally different from Kant and makes me a Platonist because I believe in this, this sense of participation. So I think um, if, if that lands back with you well, I think we understand each other very, you understand me very well. I think that's- right. Yes, I, I, I even think I, I understand why you think that that, that is. Um, and I think it's because of those bioeconomic constraints that we have. I mean, it, it has to be to make, uh, to, so that we can give an account of evolution as well, right? So we have to participate and being in contact somehow with reality. So either way, it wouldn't make sense with evolutionary theory in, in, in a deep sense. And, and it also means that we can get, we can sidestep a lot of significant contra, uh, contradictions in Kant. Kant denies 
because the mind uh, does in his view mind frames only in terms that are relevant relative to human experience we can have no knowledge of god uh, but as as other people pointed out almost immediately that same argument applies completely to the thing in itself which means uh con becomes a, a, a kind of berkeleyan idealist and he resisted that and i don't want to get into the technicalities but um i think you're 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 very much on with uh i'm you you very much have caught the deep gist of what i'm thank I'm you that's important to me john because um because i think in this way i understand you better i think if i if i speak your language we can communicate better so that's why it was so important for me to um to get to get your feedback on that i appreciate that now i want to thank you I, it's usually um Sorry, this may come off as arrogant. I don't mean it to. It's just because of my particular education. It's usually me trying to reach the language of the person I'm talking to. Yes, I get um, that. And, and so I really appreciate uh, this. I, the idea that there, I think there's two uh, ideas that, uh, you know, uh, that I would, your first two proposals about the soul, I put yeah. them together. Because you know, uh, yeah. I think they belong together in the claim that the self is not substantial. The self is not a substance. The self is not an independently existing thing. Uh, we give up that Aristotelian model that the self is a substance. And I think a standard model of the soul, not all models of the soul and all versions of Christianity by any means, or in uh, Islam or anything like that, but many central models of the soul is that it is a substance. It is a standalone thing to which all properties and relations and actions belong. And I think that is fundamentally uh, misplaced. Um, I think it is to get things exactly the wrong way around. I think and this goes to what you were saying uh, about no thingness and other things. I think the relationality, the intelligibility um, is primary and that relata emerge out of that relational field. And this maps very well to the bottom of our physics and the top of our physics. And so I'm not seeing anything really, um, you know, uh, bizarre or weird. And I won't go into that argument, but I, I am totally in agreement. And, and, and therefore, under the, uh, understanding the self as inherently dialogical, as self and other bound together. And I think of it as there being a deep continuity. Uh, I think John Verveke is a distributed cognition of the collective intelligence of parts of his brain all the way down to yeah. organs and systems and cells. And I think John Verveke is right part of uh, systems of distributed cognition and collective intelligence that make up various cultural environments and historical environments that he's operating in. And I think there's deep continuity down and up. And I, and I think that means uh, the self is inherently non-substantial, so it's not a thing. Uh, if by thing we mean a bounded, spatio-temporal, independently existing thing. And uh, I think there is this deep continuity down into the depths of our body and up to the heights of our spirit, because that's, uh, that's what we're actually talking about here. And in that sense, it is a body double, and I agree with that, right? It's sort of it's bound to the body in this and, and our embodiment in a very powerful way. Um, and then this idea that we, like the cosmos, are enmeshed in the issue of the one and the many, the emergence and the emanation. Um, I think that is correct. And I think that's a profound example of participatory knowing. It's not that we know the one and the many, we are the one and the many. We know it by participating in its very principle and processes. Of course, the, co the, co the content of your cognition and mine are different, but they share this same fundamental grammar and we share it together with reality. And I think that is a deep, deeply important thing. And so I like the final proposal. I'm coming to your final proposal and then I'll shut up which is no, there's something in, thank you there's something in us that is like the neoplatonic one there is something in us that is that participates but but it is not a part because it is the very principle of participation itself and there is something in reality that is no kind of thing that is it is the very principle of thingness right that uh, of th of things emerging of them being intelligible of their of them entering into relationships with each other 
And so I do think there, and Proclus talked about this, there's the one within us that participates in the one without us, but of course they are ultimately just in some important and very hard to articulate sense one. Um, and so I like that proposal. I like the proposal. Uh, turning young young into more of a Neoplatonist would be, I think, a wonderful thing uh, to do. Um, I, I, he's very Platonic. I often call him the Plato of the psyche. His notion of archetypes is just the notion of the forms yes, of the exactly. psyche, right? Um, and so I think all of this um, deeply resonates. I hope I've done it justice in my reply to all of your proposals. Thank you, John. That's wonderful. And especially the last part that reminded me of we being the one that reminded me, I mean, that's such a, that's such a platonic idea. Um, so I want to circle back to the meaning crisis with that. Um, yes, yes. I'm yes, really please. grateful for, for you bringing back also this Persian heritage into the meaning oh, crisis. Yeah. I'm an Iranian. I'm, I'm Persian. And, um, so first of all, thank you for that. <laughs> well, my partner, my partner, who is the profound, beloved love of my life, um, is Persian. I didn't know that. <laughs> okay, oh, that, that hits my heart. <laughs> She's easily one of the best people I have met in my entire life. Yeah, I believe that. Um, and um, what you said with the one, we being the one, this reminded me um, of, a, of a Persian myth by one of those um, Persian mystics and um, Sufis. It's Attar. He's, um, I think he's one of the teachers of Rumi, if I'm not mistaken. The name is familiar to me. I'm, I'm, yes. I'm learning a lot about the Sufi heritage right now. And there is this the philosophical Silk Road. Yeah, it's, it's so interesting. And um, there is this um, mythological being, it's called Seymour. Seymour is actually the spirit of intelligibility. I didn't know this. Say this again. How, do, how, how would I spell that? that? Um, so S-I-M-O-R-G-H. Okay. And, the and, spirit of intelligibility. Yes. That's amazing. Yes, and and Attar had had this idea that um, oh, I forgot. It's it's called. I think it's the Conference of the Birds. I think it's called. If I'm or not Parliament mistaken. of the Birds, I think I've heard. Yes, I've heard exactly. Ones. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And there are like thousands of thousands of birds that 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 fly to to find Seymour, and they have to oh. go through seven valleys, and it's one is the Valley of Self Deception, one is the Valley of Detachment. And all those things. And, and ultimately what happens is that out of those thousand birds, only 30 survive and they, and they get there, but they don't find Seymour. They don't find this thing, this big bird, this mythological creature. They understand that they are Seymour. And you know what Seymour uh -huh. means in Persian is C means 30 and more means bird. So 30 birds they survive and they realize they are actually the one. Yes, yes. So yes. that reminded me totally of that. Oh, I got to get this. I've heard of this and I've never read it, but I'm going to order it once we're done speaking because I, I, I've got to read this. This is wonderful mythos. So this brings us into that by which, and this is where Kant struggles, in fact, and where I'm trying to be very much more influenced by Corban. Yes. Ibn Arabi, Corban, oh, right? Um, in some ways, sort of already the imaginal as that which bridges between the one and the many and the inner and the exactly. outer and is not the imaginary. We don't look at these images. They are, I, they are like icons. We look through them like the way I'm looking through my glasses. But it is also the way in which the world can reach back through them into us. Absolutely. It is not just that way. It's both ways. Um, it is in a sense. I, it's a Go ahead. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's so it's so wonderful that you invoke this idea and i think this is so important to understand that the imaginal is again not a thing and and that's why we think imaginary or imagination or imaginal is not yeah. something real but it is deeply real because it has this power it's something like a catalyst and i learned this also when you look at at in and i that's why i love 
you know, coming from the place of children and adolescents as an, as a psychotherapist for children and adolescents and working and researching on them, you learn so many things. And, and again, this is also what I, what I want to add to IFS and to this whole ecology of awakening to meaning and, and all of that, because you can learn so many things from them. I mean, Rogers, Carl Rogers, he was, he was a yeah. school, um, what well, I think it was a school counselor, you know, guidance, uh, guide and, and um, you learn this so well from developmental psychologists, like when you take Piaget or or other different uh, or other uh, developmental psycho psychologists like Mahler or even Winnicott. When you have this kid, let's say it's two or three years old, right? And it try it has to learn this normative developmental task of separation, the mother infant separation. In in psychoanalytic theory, you you would call oh, what it needs to is it has to have this. Um, how would this call how would they call this this um this object like like the like the doll um uh there's the it's a transitional object transitional the object, object exactly they yeah. have the transitional object uh, yeah, i only had the, yeah. the german name yeah. for it and it's a it's serious play it's it's yes. a catalyst it's this imaginal thing that they're involved in so that they can understand and and i think this is where it comes together is that how can I have my mother's love while at the same time uh, be able to differentiate, yeah. right? So you bring in the spirit of the mother, of the caregiver into this liminal space. And I would say into the playground when we talk about yeah. this theory, when yeah. we talk about yes. play. And Winnicott would too. Yes, yeah. exactly. And I would, and, and this is where I would um, want to add, um, Vygotsky too, right? Yes. Yeah. I love what you're doing here. You're bringing Vygotsky and yes. Winnicott together with the imaginal. Please go. The, go on. This yes. Is, this and is I think it's so important because what it does is that the doll or the transitional object that I'm playing with, what I do is I immerse into, into something that, that catches me that is outside of my faculties at the same time it's in me and it grips me and i think where Rigotsi comes in is that it's it's this the zone of proximal development i think where we really transform and develop is this imaginal space because it is between this overload and and the underload it's between the infinite and the finite and that's why i think it's inta esse right so it's yeah, my yeah, interest yeah. that yeah, guides yeah. me that yeah. guides me into this imaginal liminal space where I can, where I can have, you know, have the cake and eat it too. Right. So I, I have the spirit of the caregiver at the same time, I have the spirit of individuation. And, and this only can happen when I have this catalyst, this in the sense of transitional object or the serious play. And I think interest is such a wonderful marker. And what happens is that there's so interesting research. I'm, I'm sure you know about, about private speech. Right. So when you and I think, again, this is where IFS comes into play. It's this dialogical practice. Now, what, what developmental psychologists talk about when you talk about private speech or self-talk is that you, you can observe this behavior. A kid is in exactly in this liminal or, or imaginal space or in the zone of proximal development when it starts to talk to itself, but not yes. internally. They talk loudly to themselves. Yes, yes. They yes. are and many adults I, continue that habit. By yes, the way. many adults talk aloud to themselves. Exactly. By themselves. Exactly. Yeah. And and what I think what happens is that we 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 complexify, we particularize, we individuate. Um, no, sorry, not individuate, but individuate in the sense, but you know, um, differentiate in the sense. And and what we do is then by this by this. We learn how to internalize those voices, let's say of the uh, caregiver or the parent. And then we talk to ourselves. So, and, and I think this aspect of dialogical self is so important. And this is actually where development happens. And I think IFS, and I, I would say now two things about this. In one sense, IFS helps us through this inner um, uh, dialogical self process. At the same time, I think IFS can still also learn from the practice of children and adolescents and, 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 and enhance its own method methodology. And that's why I think it's so important to bring in back those aspects of, of uh, childhood and adolescence too. So 
Yeah, I'm sorry. I shut up now. So what do no, you no, think? No, 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 no. That was beautiful. Uh, first of all, the, the, I, I'm going to have to remember to cite you on this. Um, this bridging uh, between you made between the imaginal and then transitional object in Winnicott and then integrating that with Vygotsky. And of course, when the child starts to talk to themselves, that's how they develop metacognition. Exactly. Which is essential, for, essential for rationality. And I think that and for self-direction, long-term planning, um, all of that stuff, even sense of self is mo is modified significantly. Um, I think that's right. I think the fact that I have a book, I haven't read it yet, uh, a person looking at self-talk. Um, that's another name for the private speech, right? And the fact that we devote so much time for it means it must, it probably has some very powerful adaptive functionality, and yet we don't investigate it. We treat it as noise or silliness or some bad habit. And this is because we're bound up to the buffered self that Charles Taylor's talked about. We're bound to the monadic self. We don't realize, no, no, talking to yourself is like you you will kind of go insane if you don't do that. I I imagine there might be some people who transcend to a, a, a witness consciousness. But I think of Castaway and I think of Wilson and how powerful Wilson exactly. became. Exactly. Right. Uh, and um and and the profound grief. A spoiler, by the way, the profound grief that uh, Tom Hanks's character has when he loses Wilson. Um, and um, I think all of that, I think all of that is just so pregnant with something that is deeply culturally relevant, significant, pertinent to addressing the meaning crisis. Because I'll just make a quick proposal to you. I think part of what drives the meaning crisis is this notion of the monadic self the 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 single static substance self um and because that drives us into a kind of nominalism it drives us into a radical self other uh, adversarial kind of processing it it's a it's an important driver um and it makes us resistant to alternative states of consciousness because they are seen merely as deviants from the true self or something like that um and so i think I'm proposing to you that I think IFS and related uh, practices, you know, there's, you know, empty chair therapy, yes. gestalt, there's ally work, and I'm talking a lot with uh, Barnaby about this, right? I think all of these things are attempts to both bottom up from practice, real, real transformative practice and top down from theory, provide us with a significant and rich alternative to the yes. monadic self. I, I absolutely agree. I think this whole idea of monad is is difficult um because i think it's also bound to this idea of having and being in the habit oh yes and it's, i think it's this very is much about yeah it's modal confusion all the absolutely. way through yeah it's modal confusion and and this and and being trapped in the in the having mode i think is one of the most important drivers of the meaning crisis and again now we can circle back to what i how i you know in my own biography saw how not only the the bad place that we are in but also how ifs played in into this so um and and again we, i think there are two ways now to where, where we can connect to the meaning crisis again and and one is via the mental health crisis in adolescence and the and the meaning crisis in adolescence and and we can talk about this in a second and the other one is again this missing anthropology that i see in modern human science um and into related fields like medicine psychiatry and psychotherapy yes. etc and i think it's devastatingly contributing to the meaning crisis and i saw this and again i see this in practice and 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 and, and also in 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 my re research and because there we have these deep problems with the current notions and our theoretical notions of of psychopathology that's one but also as well with this evidence based translation into into treatment and um and there are several reasons and we can you know have the, have a whole you know podcast on on this alone but they're like yeah, yeah. understanding um illness as something as symptom aggregates which is you know a, a deception or again the ignorance of non ergodicity right so uh, independent uh, assuming independent events then committing ecological fallacies, right? The gen generalizability to individual pro uh, problem, 
there are like deviation from protocols. If you, if you deviate from the protocol, which is actually only a protocol for a randomized control trial, then it's, it's not, you know, it's bad practice or pseudoscience. And there, there are a plethora of problems, which I, again, I would say it's a lack of proposition and non-propositional knowing. So right. by reducing, right. again, I, I'm not, I'm not saying or advocating that evidence base is is wrong or bad. I want to be clear about this. I think evidence. Yeah, I, I get that. I, and you get, right? I so get that. I, get I think that. we have to go beyond this notion of non proposition uh, of, of propositional and bring back all those other piece you talk about into this. And this is where yeah, I really I'm see this landscape that it's missing. And it's, and it, it's, it is deeply problematic because we have this dehumanized anthropology and it's so interesting. Roland May talks about this in, um, uh, the discovery of being, he actually, he points to the behavior mod, uh, modification therapies. And I, by training, I am a behavioral therapist. So I have deep sympathy for that. I think there was a lot of wisdom in it because there's, it's embodied. You do things, you experience things. So, but what he wonderfully points out is that, especially in those types, we have this, we have this missing anthropology. We actually don't have a conception of men, of, of human beings. So, and I think this is deeply, deeply difficult. And now I don't know if you know this, John, but what happens right now in the field of bioethics is that there is a return to phenomenology, actually. Oh, that's good news. That's really, really interesting. There is this um, philosopher, he's, he's called Frederick Sveneus. He's, a, um, he's Swedish and he has this book even, it's called Phenomenological Bioethics. And it's so interesting because there are several scholars and, and, and people in, in this academic field that argue now for even a definition of Ill illness being defined as a meaning crisis, as a crisis. Oh, wow. Meaning. Yes. Wow. And that's so interesting. It's even called illness as, and now listen to the language, as an unhomelike being in the world. Disease, like going back to the etymology of the or original word. Yes. Right. So, um, Fortunately, this happens, but I think all those technological advancements, and we know this, you, you talk about this all the time, that they, um, uh, the, the technological changes happen before the meaning crisis and et cetera. So there is this whole disenchantment that runs through this modernity, also runs through medicine and, and psychotherapy, et cetera. So I think this is what I'm really concerned about. Um, and again, meaning is, so what we can, the, the, the lesson that we can get out of is that meaning is not an epiphenomenon. It's not easily dispensed with. It's crucial. It's necessary, even from a bioethical standpoint, right? And, and again, because we're more than just a sum of, you know, cogs and, 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 and gear wheels and this mechanistic reductionistic thing. And, 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 and now there's Thomas Fuchs. He's a, he's actually a professor of, phenomenological psychiatry. He has this Carl Jaspers. Um, uh, he's a professor for Carl Jaspers in, in Heidelberg, I think. He makes oh, this, I love Yeah, Jaspers. he makes this wonderful point that medicine is actually a re relational. Medicine is relational. It's a, it's a relational, I don't know, I don't want to call it science, but a practice. It's a relational practice. So. Wow. Uh, who is that second person? Does he have a book or? Thomas Fuchs. Um, he, I, he has lots of books. Um, oh, I think he even has one in English. He, he publishes a lot in German, but there is one. I will forward it to you, um, or I can look it up in okay. a second. Thomas Fuchs, um, really interesting. Uh, I had the privilege to talk to him once in a, in a, in a conference. So, um, yeah, it's, I mean, it is there, but it's still concerning. Um, and so to me, to me, it was by, again, by graphically to, to link my work to the meaning crisis into IFS is that, to me, it was clear from the get-go, from the beginning, that we're not only in a affinitary predicament, but also in a spiritual one. And yeah, obviously yeah, yeah, due yeah. to our affinitude, and it's related to that. But there is this deep spiritual deprivation that we have. And you see this when you work. I mean, I worked in, in oncology. Meaning is really, really important. And, and even the evidence-based practice, you have meaning-centered psychotherapy that is actually, you have efficacy right there. So it's actually Viktor Frankl's logotherapy um, revisited and, and done for oncology. It's done by um, Breitbart, it's called. It's a wonderful researcher. And it's, it's getting there. And, and again, working with adolescents, and especially those borderline types in and, and this crisis center that I'm working with, is that 
it's so salient, it's so present, and it's so obvious that we are lacking this how we meet a person. And and IFS helps me there to to again to meet and not to reduce it to some. I mean, obviously, a model is always prone to reductionism, and I can reduce to you to your protectors or managers or exiles too. But it helps me if done correctly. Again, I think it helps me to to connect to the to the human being again. And and this is where I see IFS helping because John, ultimately, what I think, and let's see what you think about this. I'm sorry if, I, if I'm talking that much. Um, no, 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 no. You're great. Keep going. Keep going. <laughs> ultimately, what I see, uh, what what is happening is that this momentum of healing, in especially experience in IFS, but I think it. It, it goes beyond IFS. I think IFS is just the proxy. It's a placeholder for what is happening is there. What happens is that agape heals. I see it as a deep agapic love that happens. And I see this in therapy interpersonally, right? This, this, this horizontal axis you're talking about. But I also see it in the, within the model itself in those in this in those um technical steps you do especially for example you talk about the socratic shift right and and i want to propose that before we do the socratic shift we need the process of validation i can't get you to change and to into the state of aporia i mean i could but it's only maybe it's not long lasting i get back into this attractive state after a while but if i really am with a part i i am with a part. It's like being with a part, right? It's like I validate you. Validating means that you are valid. Your whole reason, your raison d'etre, the reason of being, it's it's valid. You you have a reason to be there. You're functioning, you're, you're framing, whatever you do, it's it's so important that you get acknowledged. Because what I think I, I think I, I want to propose to you, John, um that we do the Socratic shift a little bit later. So before we do the Socratic shift, we validate because if we don't do this, we get into again the having mode, and then it's again the court, um, um, uh, not the courtyard, but the courtroom of debate. It's not the courtyard of of di uh, dialogue, but it's the courtroom of debate. Because if I just um, spill this over you, and I and I and, and I. Um, um, it's it's it, well, well, I, well. Let me reply because yes, I, yes, I, yes. I, please. <laughs> I, okay, so first of all, um, uh, to your uh, the point a, a, a couple uh, minutes past that you know propositional tyranny has infected medicine, and we've lost we've lost touch with the non-propositional knowing, and that's where a lot of the meaning participation occurs, uh, and the meaning participation is a fundamental being together, being with, um, and that's part of what participatory knowing is knowing by being with exactly um and, and so all of that i think uh, i think that tracks very well it goes to the work i'm doing with terry dentistry about uh, trying to open up what we mean uh by health and uh and and, and medicine and so i i'm completely consonant with that um i think the thing you're you're saying right now i i take i mean it, it is an, it is exemplary constructive criticism i think you're right i and this goes to what Seth Allison was talking about, where when you're talking about agape, he talks about integrating attachment theory and IFS, and it, you actually have attachment relationships with your parts, and you have to bring in sort of EFT, um, emotion focused therapy kind of techniques to get into proper relation. And then I said to him, once you're doing that, what I've done though is I've also brought, and maybe this is the bridging, I sort of bring some of the Socratic into my interaction with my parts. Because I try to get them to recognize their function. I try to recognize, get them to, I try to enhance their own self-awareness and their own, therefore, responsibility to themselves. Um, so they go from just enacting their functionality to reflecting on it, uh, which also um, opens up spaces of possibility for them, which I think is, uh, but and I And that's totally great. I, I learned it actually from you. And I, and I actually... Now I'm trying to incorporate it more into my practice. I oh. love this Socratic move and shift. Actually, when you, when you said that in, I think it was episode eight in, in, in After Socrates, it's like, whoa, yeah, I've never done this. You know, do the Socratic shift on the part. It's like, wow. Yeah, but I think that you and Seth are correct. 
that it's premature to do that unless the attachment issues and the and the and the and the reciprocal recognition has taken place. The being with has to be in place, right, in order to shift you out of the having mode, in order to open you up for the real possibility of genuine Socratic practice, as opposed to just using or having a Socratic technique. That's how I would put it. And I think you are exactly right about that. And I've been trying to incorporate that in to my practice. And we are going to try and see how we can feed this in. We See, the problem the Verveki Foundation faces is we, we, one of our steadfast principles is we are not offering therapy because we are not properly vetted or certified to do that. We have, we have affiliate relationships with therapists who can come in if people hit crisis or distress, but we, our practices are not therapy. And trying to figure out how to get that, what you just said, which I agree. Do you, do you see the problem we're struggling Absolutely. with? Absolutely. Right? It's like what you said, I think, is deeply right. But we will not offer therapy for principled reasons, right? I think gen genuine bioethical reasons, we will not do that. And so there's a struggle here. And maybe, you know, off camera, you know, you and Chris and Taylor and I could talk about maybe a way of doing this uh, that could, could pick up on, I think, the very legitimate point you just made while still respecting our ethical requirements of not engaging in therapy. And, and, uh... Can I add to that? Um, I want to compliment you for that. I think it is actually, even from, from the ethos, it's the right, or the telos, it's the right move. I think, and, and this is, again, the problem that I have and that I was trying to allude to when I, when I talk about evidence-based practices in psychotherapy. I think it's, it's, it's a fatal mistake, and again, contributing to the meaning crisis, if we pathologize everything. Not everything has to be a psychotherapeutic um, modality um, and intervention or technique. Now, obviously it can inform our practices, but I, but for it to be pedagogical, I think it's way more important. So I think therapy can help there, the techniques. And to be fair, the Socratic move that I'm proposing, IFS accounts for it. Now, this is when you do the integration. What you do when you talk to the exile, for example, and then you have this unburdening and now we don't have to go into the details right now, but you invite back the protector. And now you do the Socratic move. And now you yeah, hopefully yeah. do the Aporian and you say, now how can you contribute to the, to the state after the alleviation of pain and suffering, after the unburdening? Now, again, I, I still think that you're right. And I, th and, I, and I love that you're doing the pedagogical work because, again, I think it's I, – I'm actually – really afraid of the fact that we that we are pathologizing everything especially when it comes to adolescence and, and you know we talked about the archetype of the adolescent and we should talk about this maybe another time but it's the idiosyncrasies of of adolescence are so important and crucial and we tend to i mean not only with regards to adolescence we tend to pathologize a lot of things so I, I'm deeply grateful for the work of, um, of the Verveki Foundation, but it not just, you know, being um, psycho or, or therapeutical, but it's more pedagogical. I think it's a wonderful and noble thing to do, John. Thank you. But um, and uh, you, you, of course, are coming back because um, <laughs> uh, I do want to talk about the archetype of the adolescent and how it fits. I can talk about everything for like <laughs> or anything for like hours with well, you, honestly. Uh, I think. <laughs> talking with you and having other people hear what you have to say, I think is extremely valuable. Um, yeah. The, uh, I mean, so um, I, I just, yeah, I do want to uh, pick your brain and your colleagues about that particular problem. I, I we don't, I, I'm not asking us to solve it here and this is not the right place to try and solve <laughs> it, but I do think, you know, there's a way of, I want to recognize, I want to recognize and be responsible to the truth you've articulated while still, still being governed by the principle, the ethical principle that I've articulated. And that's a tricky thing to do. And trying it to is. figure out how to do that is something I'd like to talk yeah, about. Yeah, it's a dance. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's, it's, it's a very careful dance. I want I wanna bring back a little bit um, about, because you've, you've said it a few times and it's deeply, deeply impactful to me. And it, I, I, we, we had to talk about other things. So I wasn't able to pick it up, but I wanna pick it up now. Yes. So you've often invoked, you know, uh, and I think the self is metaxu. This is the 
ancient Greek word for it between. I think the self, um, well, I should be careful. This is Highland's interpretation of what the, the central argument of Plato was, which is we are the relationship between finitude and ultimacy, between finitude and transcendence. And if we, if we try to identify with either one of the poles, and if we lose the polarity and try to identify with either one of the poles, we either fall into, sur into servile despair or we, we go through inflationary hubris. And spirituality, um, in, in, the, in the proper sense, in the, or at least, sorry, that was inappropriate. Spirituality in the Platonic sense that would be proper to Plato's framework is that um, we enable, we educe and educate, we draw out and we also transform people so that they are capable of holding that tonos, that creative tension between that, like a profound opponent processing that gives them the most profound optimal grip on their fundamental orientation reality is you have to get this opponent processing between your finitude and your transcendence, right? Between, right, how you are as a, as a single being and the relationship you have to ultimacy, but that you are that tonos. You're like the tension of the bow as Heraclitus t talks about the logos of the, of the psyche, right? And that, and, and that, that is kind of the deepest, most profound opponent processing, and that is the source of our deepest, most profound optimal gripping, um, our most profound orientation. And I, wa I want to know it because you've invoked the, that those that pair multiple times in our conversation. How does that proposal land to you? That that's um, a deep thing. I'm about to teach a course for the Viveki Foundation on literature and the meaning crisis, and wrestling with these books. Um, in which you see human beings wrestling with the meaning crisis and it's precisely the way the meaning crisis throws this tonos into whack and either drives people into despair or drives them into inf an inflation the heart of darkness is a, a is a classic example or moby dick right do you think sorry this was a long preamble but, but i hope it's landing uh, do you think that ifs especially because it's doing the imaginal it's getting us related to the transitional object. It's moving us out of the metatic self, getting us to inhabit and be a metaxu, a, pure, a, a purely relational being in deep relation to relationality, which is ultimate. Do you think IFS in, therefore can help us with this fundamental commitment to our true humanity, which is the tonos, the creative tension, the opponent processing between finitude and transcendence? Do you think that is that just too far afield or is it a good situating? It, 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 because to me, it seems that a big part of the meaning crisis is the way we lose the polarity and we, we get attracted to either one of these poles in either nihilism or narcissism. And they're not opposites. They are two sides of the same coin. Yes. Wow. What a question. Um, I hope I can be fair to this question because Obviously, I'm not, I cannot speak for the whole IFS community, but only from my perspective of it. But I think IFS has the potential to do so. Now, again, with the monad, I think, or the having mode, I don't think it's, it's the panacea. You said it yourself. It cannot There's be no a panacea. panacea. It has to be embedded yeah. in an ecology, right? And yeah. no matter what method, technique, paradigm, whatever you want to use, there are ways to do it, you know, good or, you know, better and, and worse, right? So um, I think it has the potential to do so. And I think if, if IFS is done properly with this whole sapiential framework around it, then I think it's so powerful. But I've also seen people, again, being trapped in the having mode at the same time using IFS and do the spiritual bypassing. So I think it's a matter of, it's, it's the howness, how we do things that matters more than, than w the whatness, <laughs> right? So, well, you know, that, that's a standard definition or at least a distinction between knowledge, which is a, understanding. A, a what and wisdom is the how, you know, um, and yeah. Um, so. Yeah, so again, again, to be, yeah, I, I think if done properly, it has, 
because I think of this essentially agopic element to it, and I really think, and, and, and this is what I see happening in therapy, John, um, there is this magical moment happening if you, and I'm at, in this times, I'm really proud to be part of it, to participate in it. When you, when I, and I'm, and I think I'm privileged to witness healing at times now. And, and this is so interesting. I don't consider myself as, as the one that heals. I only participate in it. And, and it's so interesting because Plato has this critique of therapia theon, um, and, and, and he think it, it, because it, it, it relates to this, to, to God, right? To, to theon. And, but, but therapia theon, I think it's, if you properly do it, what therapy means or theon means or, or therapy means in, in this case is that in its deep sense, etymologically is it's your ser your servant of God. Now, I think what happens in those moments in, in the therapy room is when you witness healing is that you are part of something bigger, what you're re relating to. And, and and it's a beautiful thing that happens. And that's why there, um, you can invoke the aesthesis, right? The the perception, the aesthetics. The aesthetic, and that's why I think that beauty is the, as the primary thing is absolutely correct. It has this beautiful, elegant to, thing to it. And, and, and what IFS brings here is this moment of not only of logos, where the good, the true, and the beautiful, I think where, where they are one is actually the logos. I think in... Meaning is where the good, the true, and the beautiful are actually, you cannot, they're not the same thing, but at the same time, you cannot, you know, they're not separate, right? And, 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 and this, this wonderful, you, you said that IFS is Platonic and, and Jungian. I would also say it's Augustinian in the sense yes. that it's, yes. it's agapic, right? This moment of love that's happening is what transcends both. And this is what Jung also referred to is that when, it's yeah, or Rogers too, in a sense that when when good um, when you meet a soul, there is this potential for transformation for both of them. And I often have this have this feeling that when I go out, you know, when I have my session, when they are done, I am changed myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah, um, I hope I was fair cool. to your to your no that, question. You're more than fair. You brought. I really, really enjoy talking with you. This is really. Just catching fire Thank uh, for you. me. Um, so I thought thought what you said was great. We're we're coming to a close. I'd like to bring up one uh, question, and then I'll, I want to. But first, I want to propose what we could talk about next time. First of all, I think I want to give you space and time to talk about the archetype of the adolescent. I think that's important. Yeah, that will be. And I think that I think this is necessary. also a central. Yeah, necessary, central, yeah. especially uh, for the mental health crisis, especially for the meaning crisis. I think I think you're bang on about that. Uh, the second thing I want to talk to you about, uh, is now that we broached, uh, you, you invoked agape, you invoked the possibility of something bigger and God, the logos. I mean, this has to do, and, and there's also Jung and, you know, the Red Book, and he has Philemon, and he has these, these, the, 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 these, you know what I'm talking about, and there's no good name for them. I mean, uh, Ralph calls them allies. And of course, I've had this experience, and I've been doing ally work, and I'd like to hear um I, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not expecting you to be an expert on this or anything. I just want your reflections from an IFS. Uh, I've been asking Seth Allison about this and other people um, about this. And we. So if we could talk about those two things, we'll talk about the the. Well, that we got a triple A here. The archetype of the adolescent and the ally. If we could talk about that next time, um, I would appreciate that. Would that. Be, that would be great. Okay. And so thank you for that. Thank you. And what I'd like to talk to you about right now is our final point, and it. It's a Socratic point, which means I hope it comes off as constructive. Um, so I think all of all of this is very, very well said. Um, and then a Socratic concern would be, and this is one of the critiques I've had of sort of romanticism, right? Um, which is how do we look for, notice, and ameliorate self-deception that might arise in all of this work? Because pretending that there's no self-deception at play in this, I think, is foolish. And I, I, I seriously doubt that you would make uh, uh, engage in that pretense. So um, how? So here, here's the concern. 
within therapy, I understand you are beholding to the goal of healing, and that is important. But given a lot of things we've said, and given that we're trying to make connections outside of therapy to pedagogy, and where there are deeper goals of you know right relationship to reality and the true, the good, and the beautiful, the virtue, then this issue around self-deception, I think, comes up. And I would like to know, and and if and if you want, if you want to bleed into the next our next conversation to address this more, uh, that's fine. But maybe just an initial uh, concern: How do and I mean I mean it in that I mean it in the platonic sense. How is rationality as the concern for self deception, which can often mask as self transcendence, right? Um, how is that concern properly? Um, properly met, how, how can we be responsible to that within an IFS practice? Is that a fair question? That's a very important question. I really have to think about it more deeply to give an appropriate answer, but I would say the initial, the initial response would be, and, and this goes back to the question you had before, and I forgot to mention it because I also have critique for IFS. And, um, and I think now this, this comes together. Um, I think what IFS still can do better is to enhance the notion of something like evil. And, and, and I think the ally work that you're alluding to and the archetypal work, you know, the Hillman work, that is, I think that is still missing. Now, to be fair, IFS is not one thing. This community has very diverse thinkers yep. and there are of course <laughs> beautiful people that bring that bring different aspects to it. But I would say to answer your question is to address the the self-deception is that I think it is it needs to be embedded within a system of systems. Right. And it I think what we need to do in order to overcome self-deception is that we cannot overlook the body. And I think this is very, very important. And there is this uh, brand of IFS, which is called somatic IFS. Susan McConnell, she's wonderful. She's actually one of those that, that um, close friends to Dick Schwartz who actually made the whole curriculum for the, for the training of IFS. So she's a brilliant mind. And, and she has this book, I have um, uh, somatic experience. I don't know if you know this. I have it. Oh, awesome. Have stuff, she yeah, writes yeah. really poetically and beautifully. I think so. The body work is needed. And this is, um, um, I think, something you know as a, as, as a practitioner of Tai Chi Chuan and, and yeah, Ray yeah, Kelly. Yeah. And yes. we need to bring yeah. back the body. But we also need feedback systems. And, and people can be feedback systems, right? So if I do this work alone, so I have to have a community to do so. And And this this witnessing of healing is again it's it's tenfold if you if you witness it in a in a community of healing and i was privileged or i'm privileged to to experience that over and over again and so what happens when a collective comes together now i think there is also a danger right and and this is also what jung talks about when he talks about being one and not a zero it's like okay well that you have this or Nietzsche, when he talks about the masses going to one direction, the ideological thing. So, uh, I I really have to think about it. <laughs> well, well, I mean, you've you've it links what. So let's just say that that's your initial foray, and we'll come back to it uh, next time. Uh, but what you said does connect with what you said before about IFS needs to be situated within a sapiential framework, an ecology of practices. Um, but I, I like your invocation of, you know, Rafe Kelly's work, uh, the stuff on embodiment. Um, I think that is uh, deeply appropriate. Uh, this is Marla Ponti, that the, the body ha is really fundamental to keeping us anchored uh, to uh, the world in a way that um, if we train the mind to properly listen, um, it can act as, uh, you know, a significant counterbalance to spiritual bypassing and hubristic self-deception and, uh, and other things. So let's, let's pick that up then. We'll pick up that uh, in addition to the archetype of the adolescent and ally work 
um, we can talk a little bit more about uh, bringing uh, ratio, uh, 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 logos, in the in rationality in the Socratic Platonic sense uh, into conversation with IFS. So I, I really look forward to this. I'd like I love to that. give my guests, um, this was, first of all, just wow, really <laughs> catching fire. Love this, love this. Uh, you have a brilliant and scintillating mind, and yet it is clear that it is connected to your heart. Um, <laughs> and I just just enjoyed that. I talk about uh, you know how, pe how certain people taste Right, uh, uh, like the way uh, a work of art, you know, uh, you you taste really wonderfully. Uh, uh, so that I really appreciate that. But I'd like to give my guests, um, I'd like to give my guests the the last word. Thank you, John. <laughs> it's deeply appreciated. Um, I don't know what to say. I'm grateful to be able to, you know, to be you know, talking to you. It's something that I've wanted now for years and i think now the time is right and um also with regards to your viewers and followers um it re i really think it's 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 a kairos i think we are at a pivotal point where things now come together and i want to thank you for everything you've done and you do and um i consider you a really a close friend I, I mean we haven't met personally uh yet we can become that yes i i, 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 I hope so that. too and we are tens of ten thousands of kilometers apart but i don't know if you know this but um you are you, your voice and your spirit is you know fills my home and life and work every day so in a sense you're you know very close to me on a daily basis and to be able to participate in in this whole endeavor is I, I'm really, really grateful for. And I want to thank you for al also allowing and giving the platform to come together. So thank you for that, John. So we will speak again very soon. I would Take like that. Care, I would friend. love that, actually. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'd like to announce a new course I'm going to be teaching at Halkian Academy. It's called Ultimate Reality, God and Beyond. I'll talk in a minute about that very provocative title. Uh, uh, first important things, it's going to be starting April 5th. It will be eight weeks, not eight consecutive weeks because I'm attending conferences, but it's all scheduled out. The link to uh, the home page for the course will be put in the notes to this promo. <clears throat> and um, each uh, session will be two hours. There'll be one hour of me doing a lecture and then one hour of Q&A. Now there are options you can purchase where you can attend the lecture live and participate in the live Q&A, or you can also go through this course asynchronously and you can purchase it at that level if that works better with your schedule and or your finances. Um, I've done one of these courses before, Beyond Nihilism, and um, I thoroughly enjoyed it. It was, I consider it um, by all the feedback, uh, a, a success. And I very much wanted to follow it up, um, which gets me to the title. Uh, the Beyond was um, a way of pointing to some continuity with the previous course, Beyond Nihilism, uh, which is also available asynchronously on Halkian, if you wish to take a look at that. I'm not, uh, I'm not assuming that people have gone through Beyond Nihilism. Uh, the course, Ultimate Reality, God and Beyond, is a standalone course. But I'm also structuring it so those people who have uh, taken Beyond Nihilism will find connection and continuity. That's a bit of a tricky thing to do as a teacher, uh, but I do have uh, quite a bit of experience with doing that kind of thing uh, from my many years of teaching at the university. Uh, so that's, that's one reason for the title. Now, the other title is God and Beyond. What could possibly be beyond God? What could that mean? Is it, that's just a silly contradiction, isn't it? Um, well. That's, that's the issue. That's the issue that the course is going to wrestle with. When we come into or en try to enter into a philosophically reflective and deep relationship with what we consider um, to be ultimate reality, is that relationship best captured by what we think of when we think of God? Now, what many of you will say to me is, but there's many different possible meanings. 
And that's exactly what this course will explore. Um, but the idea that there is a somewhat standard notion, uh, Abrahamic notion perhaps, of God uh, is one we'll be ref making use of and whether or not that actually is the best way of understanding ultimate reality. So in order to do that, we'll be taking a look at a bunch of thinkers. Uh, the one is Robert Carter uh, in his amazing book, The Nothingness Beyond God. And you can see the title of that book resonating with the title of the course in which he explores the work of Nishida from the Kyoto School, uh, which is somebody deeply influenced by both Heidegger and Zen. And of course, Heidegger famously, in his famous critique of ontotheology, criticized that our standard notion of God as a supreme being fundamentally misrepresents being itself, because being itself is no kind of individual thing or being. And that's the no-thingness beyond God. If God is some kind of super thing, then ultimate reality is a no-thing beyond that. And that was explored, of course, by Nishida, making use of both Heidegger and Zen. And we want to enter into discussion about this. Please understand that this is a very exploratory thing. Uh, this course is helping me do some deep thinking in dialogue with others who are coming in good faith and want to engage in deep reflection and discussion uh, in preparation for the next series I'm doing on the Philosophical Silk Road. And so being part of the course is a way of uh, participating in you know, the contribution of that project. We'll also be taking a look at the work of uh, the Canadian atheist, um, Schellingberg, especially in his book, Evolutionary Religion, but we'll also be taking a look at, uh, I'll, I'll at least be bringing in his book, Religion and uh, Religion After Science, and also talking about the hiddenness argument. He is famous for being the author of the hiddenness argument, uh, which is, considered a sort of new argument against the existence of a personal God. Now, you may say, oh, an atheist. Be very careful. Schellingberg is not a, your typical atheist. Uh, Schellingberg is somebody who wants us to look at, take very seriously the possibility of ultimate reality, and very seriously uh, what he calls a triple transcendence. That, adult, that ultimate reality is transcendent in being most real, and also, it's also in some sense most valuable, you know, beyond the true, the good, and the beautiful, um, and also most transformative. And he thinks this proposal that human beings, that there is such an ultimate reality, that human beings can enter into a relationship with it and be transformed by it, is one that we should take very seriously, but within a particular frame. He says, he points to deep time, how science has discovered deep time. Uh, billions of years in the past, billions of years in the future, uh, uh, a species has existed for 200,000 years. We seem to be spiritually oriented from about 40,000 BCE. So we have all of this going on, and yet um, we also have this deep future ahead of us. And he poses this question. He says, given the depth of the questions we're asking about ultimacy, ultimate reality, is it likely that we are mature enough as a species, that we have got complete answers to this, when, of course, we don't have complete answers about the nature of the atom, or that we don't have complete answers about how disease works, or how the mind works, or how the body works. Isn't it presumptuous to think that we have uh, finished complete answers about ultimate reality? So he wants us to engage in the, reflect upon the proposal that we might be as a species, not individual, spiritually immature. And then he asks, what, what do we need to do in order to mature ourselves across time and across generations such that we could come into the kind of work that would give us a plausible claim on getting an answer to that question of whether or not ultimate reality has that triple transcendence for us. And I think this is a very profound idea because I think the deep time aspect of our reflections upon ultimate reality within standard axial age religion and uh, philosophy has not been properly understood or taken into account.
And so this is very provocative. It opens us up and it, of course, allows science at the table. Now, of course, he also criticizes, and this is what makes him so interesting, he also criticizes the atheists who, thinking, who think they can come to a complete conclusion about ultimate reality from a framework that is very plausibly one of spiritual immaturity. So we will be taking a look at that, and we'll be looking at what happens if we adopt deep humility with respect to the question of ultimate reality God and beyond? What happens? What, what do we open ourselves up to? And what becomes really important for him is the role, the aspirational role of imagination, especially in the imaginal sense. We'll then be taking a look at the astonishing work of James Filler, who I will actually be meeting in person in April. Uh, unfortunately, his book is quite expensive. So instead, we'll be reading three papers where he makes the uh, argument um, that the Neoplatonic tradition made an argument, which is that ultimate reality is pure relationality rather than um, a substance. Now, when he uses substance, he's ultimately meaning it in not just a Cartesian sense, but in Aristotelian. Substance is our individual things that are considered to be able to exist independently and are the, the subjects of properties. They're the owner of properties, and they enter into relations with other things. And so there are things from which relations emerge. And Filler's arguments go to show that that seems to have things exactly the wrong way around. It looks like relationality is ultimate and the things emerge out of it. And so, of course, this relationality is a no thing uh, because that's just what things emerge from. And this meshes, of course, with some of the fundamental arguments of Neoplatonism. And I think moving off of that thing-based substance ontology is a fundamental shift, a new way of thinking profoundly and relating to ultimate reality that takes us into that space of God and beyond. The final person is Bracken, whose book, The Divine Matrix, is written from a Whiteheadian perspective, which I think is very important because Whitehead, in some ways, integrates that pure relationality with the, with the dynamic view of the world given to us by science. But what he does is he takes a look, Bracken, at um, the Western tradition's reflections on ultimate reality and Eastern uh, reflections, Taoism, Vedanta, Buddhism. And he is trying to propose what we can see being held in common. And this, of course, is very much like a through line, like the philosophical Silk Road. And he, he comes to some very interesting uh, uh, conclusions from this argument about what ultimate reality is and how we could come to a shared understanding. It doesn't mean we all will become Hindus or we'll all become Buddhists or we'll all even become Whiteheadians or that we will all become Christians or Jews. What he says is this gives us a shareable relationship to ultimate reality between people who talk about that ultimate reality as a god and people like Taoists with the Tao or the Vedantists with Brahman or the Buddhists with Shunyata who do not talk about ultimate reality as God, but nevertheless consider it to be triply transcendent. And so this is all in service of an observation that I have been sharing with a lot of the people that I enter in deep discussion with, which is in response to the meaning crisis, there seems to be an advent of the sacred taking place. In many different parts of the world, different communities, different philosophical currents, and I've just pointed to you a bunch, there's many, many more that converge on this. People are fundamentally reframing our relationship to ultimate reality. And I think this is a way of trying to give us a new way of living in relationship to the sacred, which will offer people a living response to the problem of the meaning crisis. Now, this is all something I am proposing, and I am proposing that we discuss it together, and you, you help me as much as I try to teach you, that we discuss it together as we try to wrestle with this question about ultimate reality, God and beyond. So I look forward to seeing you in the course. As I said, the notes for both the date, which starts on April the 5th, and the link and how you can register will be found in the in uh, will contain the information in the notes to this 
uh, promo. So thank you very much. And I look forward to seeing you in ultimate reality, God and beyond.